Thank you for listening to this presentation on S-Trace. Before we start, a few words about myself. I'm working as a software maintenance engineer at Red Hat since four years, remotely from Grenoble in the French Alps. My area of expertise is everything dealing with user space, which is something like 1,000 packages distributed by Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I daily use S-Trace to troubleshoot customers' problems, in particular when it deals with slownesses. For example, connecting using SSH taking 10 seconds or more. Hangs of commands, for example, DF or PS just hanging for no re obvious reason. Or just unexpected inactivity of services. For example, SSH not reading logs from the journal or from files. S-Trace is my favorite tool for this kind of issue. Let's go to the agenda. First, I will briefly introduce S-Trace and the option I like to use. Then go through some very limited technical details which are really necessary to understand. I assume here that you have some knowledge of system programming in C or Python programming. I will then tell you when s phrase may be of some help and when not, depending on the problem to herbal shoot. I will go through some s phrase output analysis and finally, I will present you six examples of s phrase usage. S-Trace is a tool that prints system calls executed by the process being monitored. It prints both system calls arguments and return value. There are several of options available, including the option to inject false, but this is not the subject of this talk. The so one I use by default are shown below in red. Minus F to follow children, minus TTT to print nice human readable timestamps and time spent in the C call. Minus V to show structures unabbreviated, it's a kind of verbose mode. Minus S with a value, usually 1K, to record up to 1K characters in strings. S trace is all about syscalls. In brief, syscalls are a way for a user process to interact with the kernel. Every time a user process needs to access a resource, for example, a file or a socket, it needs to use a syscall. However, the application developer usually doesn't call syscalls directly but through the corresponding glibc function, which usually expects very similar functional arguments. For example, the application programmer will use open, which maps to sys open. The difference is the glibc function does more and more checking and is platform independent. Most of glibc functions are mapped to syscalls in a one-to-one -one manner, expect a few, such as for and v4 that map to clone on rel7 and later. Hence, getting information on syscalls is very similar to checking the corresponding JDC function man page. In section 2, to get the list of syscalls for your system, check the syscalls man page in section 2. Let's now have a brief overview of how S-Trace works. S-Trace uses the P-Trace syscall interface, which basically sets breakpoints in syscalls of the callee. See the man page in section 2 for details. Once in place, Every time a syscall is entered, the process stops and S-Trace is notified. S-Trace collects the information about the syscalls, then tells the process to continue. Upon syscall returning, again the process stops and S-Trace is notified. S-Trace collects the return value of the syscall and computes the time spent and tells the process to continue. Finally, S-Trace prints the collected data to standard error or more usually to a file when using using the minus O option. The consequences of using ptrace are multiple. Firstly, the process being monitored is serialized. Every time ptrace stops the process, all the threads stop as well. Secondly, this slows down and the monitored process execution by a factor of 10 or more. Thirdly, you cannot have multiple programs monitoring the same process. For example, you cannot have GDB and strace attached to the same process. And finally, later we'll see that output of s race can be quite difficult to read. Now let's see when s race may help. s race may help whenever syscalls are involved. When a command is hanging or is executing slowly, when a process seems to hang waiting for something on the network. Additionally, you can do much more. It's very helpful when you want to understand what a program does. For example, you can see which files are being opened written, which libraries are being loaded, etc. You can also observe the communication between processes. For example, you can monitor systemctl and systemd 
and see how they talk to each other to do some kind of reverse engineering. This is something I frequently do when having to handle an issue with a program I don't know anything about. It's usually easier than checking directly the source code. Finally, with the help of the source code, you can usually determine more easily which error condition happened and made the program fail. This isn't an exhaustive list. There are also cases where s rays won't help you, but sometimes it can still give you some hints about the root cause. It won't help you much if a program is running in a syscall and the syscall never returns for the kernel. Here you will have to use kernel tools such as trace CMD or system tab. Note, however, that still s rays gave you a hint that the issue is within the kernel somehow. When a program doesn't call syscalls and does computation on spins on the CPU, s trace is definitely of no help. Using pstack or gcore is more appropriate. Another scenario where it won't help much is when the issue is due to a race condition. For example, startup of services race together and lead to errors. Still, if you s trace both services and see that the issue goes away, you can then guess that the root cause is likely a race condition, which doesn't show up because s ray slows down the processes too much. When a program doesn't score, you need to use GDB. Finally, when a program exits with no obvious reason, for example, with no error message at all, s ray won't help much. Still, checking the failing C scores can give you some hints from time to time. It really depends on what the program does. To conclude this part, this is a recommended option for troubleshooting. To s trace a program and its children, use s trace minus FTTTVYY and a decent string buffer of 1K. 1K should be sufficient. You can reduce this to 200 bytes if s trace will be long running and the program being monitored does a lot of syscall activity. For example, reading or writing a lot on the network or to files. When attaching to existing processes using minus p, don't forget that existing children won't be monitored. You need to attach to the existing children as well. Finally, when monitoring a command that becomes root, for example, sudo some command, you need to have a stress run as root. I will show you later a convenient way to monitor sudo. This is required or else, once the process becomes root, you will lose permissions to monitor it. In this part of the presentation, we will now have a quick look at what s trace produces. First, when monitoring a single process, then when the monitor process has multiple threads or multiple processes are monitored simultaneously. I will also talk about some syscall errors and give you some more information about signals. Below is how the s trace output looks like when using my standard options. First, you have the PID, which isn't the PID itself, but the thread ID. For the main thread, it's the same. You then have a timestamp in human readable form, typically hour, minutes, seconds, and microseconds. Then you have the syscall name, open for example, and the syscall parameters. Upon syscall returning, s trace will print an equal sign and the result with additional details in case of error. Finally, s trace prints the time spent in the syscall. If you are using VIM, you can enable colorization using set phi type equal s trace. Let's see the example below. This is an s trace of syslog main thread being 1086. Here we see that SISO is calling the poll syscall on an array of file descriptors. The array contains only one file descriptor, which has number three. And it is an anonymous inode. So here it's not a file on the file system. Poll is used to wait for data on file descriptors. Here SISLog is interested in incoming data, poll in. It returns after 900 milliseconds with return value 0, which means timeout. Later, 
we see as his log does a read on that same file descriptor, the read failed, and Erno was set to E again, which happens when read would block and the file descriptor is configured to not block. This means that SISLOG needs to read the gain and wait for an incoming event. The last line, we see it read on the file descriptor again and this was a success. There were 32 bytes returned by read and these bytes are shown in the buffer passed to read here as second argument. Basically here it reads some data about the journal. The last parameter to read is the size of the buffer and we see from here it was set to 272. As you can see, a stray shows us a lot of potentially useful data. This was the easy case when only one process is monitored and there is only one thread. When it's not the case, we'll have a lot of unfinished resume lines as shown below. This happens because the stray prints timestamps in growing order. Let's see what we have here. We have PID 1088, which is a thread of S's log, enters the Futex is called. Futex is a fast log from user space. While the Futex was being grabbed, main strain 1086 did a poll. On next line, while the main strain is doing the poll, we see the Futex is all returned. Hence, we see Futex resumed. Later again, the poll C score returned, and apparently there was nothing on the file descriptor 3 on the second line here. This can be hard to read. To help you, usually you will filter on a specific PID using a grep command and stick to that PID. For example, with SSLog, if you are interested in the main thread only, you can just filter out all the rest. As you could see in the previous slide, we had read, return, and error here again. Is having a C score return and error really an issue? Well, it depends. You need to understand the program internals. There are well known banning pathologies. For example, E again, E, int, e restart C's are supposed to happen normally. You can check the man page of the C score failing with this kind of error. Read, for example, will return E again if it's in non blocking mode. It's then up to the application developer to handle this kind of error and likely retry the syscall. When you have a new end, which means no such file directory, it's usually not an issue, typically when it's the library linker that produces it. The library linker will search, for example, for ld.so.preload, which doesn't exist by default. When executing a program through bash, foo, for example, Bash will search for the program in various locations in your path, USR local bin, USR has bin, then USR bin. So it's expected to return ino end when stating the location and the file doesn't exist. Similarly, the linker will try to open libraries in various locations and you will see ino end if the library doesn't exist in that location. When you get epern, which is permission denied, there is likely an issue. But well, it depends on how the program effectively works. Finally, a trace can show you information about signals. Whenever a signal is received, a trace records it in a line starting with dash dash dash. There is one exception. It's with sick kill, which cannot be caught. So you will instead have a plus 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 line and see that the process got killed by the signal as shown below. If the process receives a signal from another process, for example, sick term below, you will see who sends the signal here, PID1. In this example, I told rcslog to stop through executing systemctl stop rcslog, which resulted in systemd, PID1, to send a sick term signal to rcslog. Sometimes the signal is sent by the kernel. Usually, this will make the process die. In that case here, you will see the process exit with the plus 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 kill by. And this example here, we see the kernel send a six sec B, reason being an issue accessing memory. This typically happens when the process tries to dereference an invalid pointer, 
Here it was the null pointer. Let's move to the last part of the presentation, examples. I collected six examples of real use cases to show you the various techniques to troubleshoot. In the first example, we'll be dealing with a command slowness. The customer was complaining that executing DF would take 20 seconds or more, whereas usually the execution is immediate. I hence requested to collect an S trace of the slow command. Checking the S trace, we can see that the first line is execve, which means execute the command in argument. Checking the execve function prototype, we can see three arguments. First, the binary name, then the argument passed, including as first argument the program name, which is used when the program wants to appear as another program. And finally, we have the arguments as last argument, the environment. In the example, we see the environment contains LD library pass, which is used to load libraries from non standard pass first prior to using standard location, USR lib64, for example. After the execv, we see the library linker try to load standard libraries, such as libc, from various locations, first the ones specified in LD library pass. The library is not found here, which is expected. That's not an issue. The issue here is more with the time spent to read the custom location, 440 milliseconds, which is definitely not expected. Later, more libraries are loaded and similar slowness happens, explaining why DF was so slow executing in the end. From the analysis, we know that there is something wrong reading this custom pass. This is all we can see with this trace here. The next step was to check what was going on in the kernel and particularly for this file system. For the short story, the root cause was some invalid month options for that pass passed on a cluster file system, which was creating this slowness. In this second example, we'll be dealing with SSH slowness it was taking 25 seconds to connect to the remote system. When it comes to SSH, stressing SSH itself is usually useless because most of the work is done on the SSHD side. SSH just encrypts what the user types and decrypts what is sent back by the backend, typically standard output and server error. So here you need to stress SSHD. There are two ways to do that. Either attach to main SSHD daemon listening on port 22, or spawn a dedicated SSHD daemon on some alternate port, say 8022, which will be used for testing the connection to the system. The second method is preferred, but not always possible, typically because it requires letting the firewall accept the connection on the custom port. If running SSHD on the alternate port is not possible, just attach to main SSHD as shown below. Then you connect using SSH, you experience the 25 seconds slowness before getting the prompt, and you exit, and you control C to stop its trace. If running SSHD on the alternate port, spawn it with minus DDD to let it handle only one single connection. Then you connect using SSH on the alternate port and exit once you get the prompt. And SSHD will also exit. Now we have the S trace to analyze. First, check for accept syscall, which is used to accept an incoming connection. Here we see that the connection was made by 182.168.1221 from port 60740. Note that when it's tracing the regular SSHD daemon, other users may be connecting to the system at the time you make the test. Hence, you need to find out which connections you are interested in. There may be multiple accept calls. You then need to check for a clone syscall, which is used to force the SSHD child that will handle your connection. Here, we have PID 
23918, but will handle the connection. We need to filter on that PID. The child will spawn other children, but these are usually not interesting. To filter on, the, on this PID, use the following grep command. Note that when using the recommended way, SSHD on the alternate port, there is no clone seen since, since SSHD directly handles the incoming connection. So there is no need to filter anything, it's easier. Let's see the output of the filtered S trace. At some point in time, you will see a send message on a Unix socket, which is here a debus request to systemd logging D that creates session. Later, we see a receive message on that socket, which fails with E again because the socket is in non-blocking. Finally, we see a poll on the Unix socket, which ends up in timeout after 25 seconds. Then process continues and we get a prompt. From above, we see that the issue is with the debus socket. In a nutshell, SSHD waited up to 25 seconds to have the session created, but this never happened. The code in, is part of PAM systemd, not SSHD itself. This means that systemd logging D, responsible for creating the user session, is not functional somehow. For the short story, the root cause was systemd logging D process being in a dead loop. In this third example, the customer was complaining that executing sudo su command call was slow. Because the command will execute as root, you need to use strays as root. Hence, you cannot use stray sudo blah blah blah. Instead, you will stray the terminal running the sudo command. First, you get the PID of the bash that will run the command using echo dollar dollar. In that example, the PID was 1234. Then, from another terminal running as root, execute s trace and attach to 1234, and of course, follow children using minus f flag. Finally, execute from the user terminal the sudo su command, that is slow executing. And you then get a nice S trace with everything needed to dig more into it. In this fourth example, the customer was complaining that executing a script in the terminal was working fine, but not through cron. The easy way to debug this is to estrate the cron daemon. So you just need to attach your existing cron daemon, which has PID recorded usually in run crond.pid. Then wait for the script to execute through cron. Stop this trace, then filter on the PID of the script that executed, and dig into the trace. For the short story, the root cause was an invalid SE Linux context on a file that the script was attempting to read, and resulted in permission denied. This happened because when executing the script as a user, the SE Linux context was unconfined. Whereas under cron, the SE Linux context was limited. In this fifth example, the customer was complaining that executing his daemon manually was working, but not at the systemd service. Similar to SSH, S-tracing systemctl command is usually useless, because systemctl just sends an order to systemd that will do the job itself. Hence, it's wise to S-trace systemd and children instead. So just attach to PID1. Then start the failing service, log, for example, and finally stop s trace once the service failed. Again, you need to filter what you are interested in. Similarly to SSHD, systemd will first accept the connection from systemctl. This is done through the accept for syscall. Then you will have some clones. When executing a service, systemd will spawn one child per exec start pre or exec start command. In the case of syslog, there is no exec start pre command, but only exec start command. So you just need to find which PID executes syslog itself. Here we have 24480. 
Because they are Cisrogas threads, you then need to collect all the children spawned by the main thread 24480 recursively. This can be achieved using the following grep pipe grep command below, which will return you PIDs of children. Finally, filter on all the PIDs you got using the egrep here to reconstruct your SS log trace. You can then dig into the filtered estrates easily. The final example is how to estrate the boot itself. It's experimental and may break your system. Sometimes issues happen during the boot. For example, when there are race conditions between services, or services require implicitly a device that didn't show up yet and is not mentioned in the service unit file. Again, we need here to extract systemd as soon as possible. This can be achieved using the following extract systemd service unit, which is also available on my public Red Hat space for convenience. Due to some deadlock issues, you cannot attach before systemd udfd executed. Once the service unit has been created, reload systemd and enable the service. Then boot your system with additional flags S trace, but also enforcing equal zero. Otherwise, S trace wouldn't be able to monitor children of systemd due to not executing in an unconfined context, but the context of systemd, which is init t and restricted. Note that your boot will slow down a lot because basically s -trace will monitor almost every single service being executed and children. Once you reach the prompt and see your failing service, just stop the s -trace service and dig it to the produce s -trace in slash run. I have a final slide that I would like to share. It's about SE Linux integration in upstream S-Trace. I'm convinced that showing SE Linux context monitor processes are running as may be very useful when issues are related to SE Linux. I hence propose a pull request to upstream with reference below. Unfortunately, my pull request is stuck waiting for a final reviews from S-Trace power developers. I don't manage to get traction on this since several months in info, I'm pinging the mailing list regularly. Anyway, this pull request introduces a new SC Linux, SC context, sorry, option. With this option, you will see in which context the process is running as, as shown in the example below. This example is systemd spawning SC's log as a service. Initially, the child of systemd, 26235, execute as init t the context of systemd. Then, when exec v executes, because a syslogd program is labeled with syslogd exec t, as shown in the s-trace here, we have the process chain context to syslogd t. Same PID, different context. That's super convenient and likely very useful. For now, this patch s-trace is available on my public product space. There is one build per Red Hat or federal release. So thank you for having listened to my presentation. If you have questions, don't hesitate to come back to me.